ARGs, analog horror, and unfiction in general have become some of my favorite things as of late. The idea of single individuals or teams of people banding together to tell engaging, interesting stories about fascinating concepts, reminiscing homages to times long forgotten, or just taking a modern concept and bringing it into a whole new light. The absolute creativity on display by so many talented people that work their butts off to make such enjoyable works is awe-inspiring. And while one day I would like to talk about the first ARG I ever witnessed before such a concept was as widely known and accepted as it is now, today I would just like to gush about a project that resonates with me a lot, and that is Vali Verde. I'm sure plenty of us remember video game creepypastas. Ben Drowned, NES Godzilla, Mario, and the plethora of Pokepastas, and I'm sure a lot of us felt that they eventually came off as lacking. As if people thought all you had to do to make one back then was just put blood and creepy imagery into kid-friendly franchises, which squandered a lot of the potential that these stories had to grow. But while delayed compared to other kinds of horror-related content on the internet, the evolution for this subgenre, as it were, did eventually arrive, with projects like Petscop, Catastrophe Crow, and Diminish showcasing the different means you could take these kinds of narratives. But the most important thing that all of these projects share is how convincing they make these games feel. From Petscop and Diminish being games that look so real you could almost see yourself playing them, to Catastrophe Crow being presented in such a way that you end up gaslighting yourself into thinking that you had to have seen this before. How could you miss that magazine article? Or this Space World footage, it all feels so familiar! Heck, even the recent MyHouse.wad, which was a full-on playable mod, just dropped one day and left a bewildering and endlessly enthralling rabbit hole in its wake, shows that some people nowadays aren't even going to try and convince you that something's real. They're just going to let you play it and find out yourself. But, more to the point, Valley Verde is one of the more recent projects to tackle this avenue of horror, and I just really dig its aesthetic in particular, so we're going to be talking about it today. As you'd expect, links to the channel as well as the creator's Patreon will be in the description for you to check out and support the creator and their endeavors. My video is no replacement for the real thing, but my goal is to help people learn about something that I think is neat and needs more attention. Plus, for those that need someone to help guide them through something they might be too intimidated to go through alone, I can assist with that as well. Alright, without further ado, let us begin. And now, our feature presentation. The start of the series begins with a video titled, An Introduction. This guy, who goes by Alluvium, details how he was going on a walk through a nearby park and ended up in a pretty dead patch of the woods. He finds a statue, seen here, and some recently disturbed dirt with a stray red string. Unable to pull it out, he makes a note of it for later and comes back with a shovel. After digging, he unearths what looks like a worker's lunchbox wrapped in more string, and upon opening it, he finds it's filled with styrofoam and a lone VHS tape in a bag. Watching the footage, he sees that it's just a random game, but it isn't until asking a friend that's more knowledgeable about games than him that he finds that this game was completely unknown. Not only that, but what occurred in it was... strange. They both decide to digitize the tape and showcase the findings, after Alluvium checks to make sure there's nothing incriminating about the footage, of course. And so, we get our first look at Valley Verde with Found Footage, Part 1. After we start on with the PS1 start screen, we get this screen that reads, Process of Investigation Under the Supervision of Robert Saturn and Pablo L. Gutierrez. Report Summary, Malfunctioning AI, Corrupted Learning Data, and Issues Regarding Products Specialized Hardware. Immediately giving us a reason as to why this footage exists. This game has some Ford peripheral that seems to be on the fritz, and these two, whether developers or localizers for the game, are trying to get to the bottom of it. Simple, effective, and prompts as many questions as it answers. Fantastic start. 
We then get some logo crawls showing that the company that made this is called Onyxware. They have a motto written under their logo that reads, Anata no Kokoro o Watashi Tashi no Teni, or roughly, your heart is in our hands, which isn't foreboding at all. Interesting enough to point out is that the kanji used here for Kokoro doesn't only mean heart, it can also mean mind or spirit, which I would like to reiterate, not foreboding in the slightest. Not only that, but we also get a logo for the Shizuoka Institute of Science and Technology. This is a real school, established in 1991, smack dab within the industrial and technological heartland of Japan, the Shizuoka Prefecture. Which is not only the birthplace of Suzuki, one of the biggest provider of cars, motorcycles, and marine engines, but also the Yamaha Corporation, the biggest musical instrument manufacturer in the world, who also created Vocaloids. I don't bring this up to say Hatsune Miku has anything to do with this series, but I'm not saying that she isn't involved somehow. Maybe. I'll get into that later. When given language options, the person playing picks Spanish leading to the intro starting up, but is quickly skipped, giving us the title screen. Upon picking a new game, we see a prompt telling us to not unplug the TH Brain device, restart, or turn off the console. So we got a name for this peripheral, and seems like it's a requirement to even start the game. We're unsure what it is, or how it even works, but from the name alone, it's clearly some kind of neural-related link-up. We'll have to see what that truly is at some point, but for now... completely breathtaking. We've come a long way from well-made screen caps and ROM hacking being the norm for projects like this, and I couldn't be more delighted to see it. After getting the player character all set up and getting another outstanding cutscene, we arrive at Valley Verde, Green Valley. The game asks where we want to land, and the player seemingly puts in a debug code that adds a new location to the list of destinations, Debug Shima. After showing their identification to a character named Bobson, they're instructed to meet Foxo at Town Hall to become a fully-fledged citizen, and away they go to debug Shima. Arriving in town, the player makes their way to Foxo. After receiving identification in a dingy little shack as a home, Foxo takes a moment to point out his armband, a symbol of his leadership. The Japanese shown on it, Mei Shu, even means leader, and is clearly modeled after public morales or disciplinary committees depicted in Japanese media. And before we have time to really think about that, it's time to meet the residents. Well, that didn't take long. Four minutes in, and we've already got our first signs of corruption. But it doesn't stop there. We get some glitches with the next part of the cutscene before receiving a short diatribe from Foxo, stating that the gold statue is a monument to him, and that someone called the Smiling One has given him full authority over this town. The game quickly gets back to normal, as Foxo goes on to discuss other residents like Ito, who's in charge of the museum, and the scientist Dr. Nito, alongside his boxing robot companion, Isaac. Foxo finishes up by giving a parting gif of 100 coins, and just as the player turns to go on their merry way, immediately, without any kind of warning, Foxo just rams into the player character, and not only takes all the money back, but then puts them into crippling debt. Those with a keen eye will notice that the gear shows up as this happens, the same gear that showed up when Foxo started to boast about his statue. Showcasing that, yeah, no beating around the bush here, this is absolutely corruption going on, but what it all entails, we'll have to see more to find out. 
The tape cuts to the next recording, with text showcasing that there is an anomaly with the game causing spontaneous level generation. They arrive in a land filled with cake, and upon opening their map, they show that they should be in front of a church by now, but instead, they're wherever this is. They leave, probably to check and see if the town's even still there, and it is, but going down the path leads to the cake room again. Clearly curious to see how far this goes, the player goes on, finding a room with a bunch of statues with giant photorealistic eyes staring at us, and then a room filled with art and gold as the sound of cash registers ring out. The player character is obstructed by a giant pile of coins and picks it up. They go into their inventory to drop it out of their way, but just for a moment we get to see the description for this item, which reads, You took it from the mayor's office, didn't you? Which is quite accusatory, Mr. Item Description. I literally found this on the ground. It's not like I'm keeping it. Though I could pay off my debt with this. Nah, we'll just leave it here. The player walks by a trash can that has the statue of David by Michelangelo within it, as well as another painting that depicts Simon helping Jesus carry the cross, before they're on their way to the next room, which is... Uh... The player walks forward, stopped by a drop of blood. More drops continue until the player decides to look up. As we do, we see that the sky is turned pitch black, and a jump scare with a bloody fetus emerging from the darkness causes the sky to rain blood, more fetus heads to pop out from the ground, and as the player makes a quick escape, a gloved hand holding forceps chases them. In a less horrifying room, we see TVs, radios, and vinyl record players. We also hear a song sung in Spanish about a worker telling someone off for sleeping on the job while they're trying to work. The player slows to a crawl as they try to leave this hodgepodge of entertainment, but they're soon able to go on their merry way to the next room. This room depicts silhouetted figures cowering under the might of a much bigger finger with a bright red eye. We also hear a recording of a certain someone speaking. Two people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. That was the famous speech by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Lastly, we arrive in a room with a series of gold statues staring at themselves in mirrors with the corruption seemingly getting worse. But as the player character walks on, all of a sudden, everything's fine. Clearly, we're back on track now, and this is where we were supposed to be in the first place before the anomaly occurred. The player walks by ten angel statues surrounding them in a circle as they approach a large gate. They proceed to enter it and finally find themselves in front of the church. So, let's talk about what that just was for a second. A room full of cake, a room full of watchful eyes, a room of wealth and priceless works of art, a, uh, a fetus deletus room, a room of various distractions, a room of a menacing figure intimidating the small and the weak with a gosh diddly dang Oppenheimer quote playing in the background, and a room of gaudy statues exemplifying vanity. All of these rooms very clearly depict the seven deadly sins. In order, they go gluttony, envy, greed, lust, sloth, wrath, and pride. The fact that in order to reach a church, the game's AI caused an anomaly where the player character would have to traverse through the seven deadly sins first is just... I don't even know what to call it. Poignant? Ironic? Poetic justice? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's yet another example that things are going pretty screwy around here. And the next day we have another anomaly recorded, the summary given is that Patient 2 is unable to move. The player walks into a store where a cutscene plays with the owner asking the player to deliver something to Bobson. The player refuses and actually finds Matthias here. Are you with the agents? Can you hear me? Where is Chloe? What's happening? 
a reply box shows up when the player begins to type. Can you see me? Can you see the bar? Yes, but I can't move. Do you see someone else? Do you know where the others are? What happened? I want to speak to mom. I want to speak to Mr. Kunimuchi. The player is about to type he's no longer working, only for Matthias to say he doesn't want to play anymore and to please get him out before crashing the game. It's at this point now that I'd like to bring attention to the text boxes. So far we've seen blue, red, and green, and all three have significance to them. A blue text box shows whatever the original game's dialogue is. Whenever there's a red text box with a gear associated with it, this is text that's AI generated. And green text boxes, these are reserved for people like Matthias here, i.e. they seem to be children actually trapped in the game. Or there's something else, and I'll hold off on what my theory is on that till later. The next day, we actually go into the church, with this time the anomaly saying that there's a random appearance of data. Inside, we hear the priest giving a sermon. As they're in the church, they click to inspect and the camera pans to show off different parts of the building. And this is where I'd like to take a moment to praise how much attention to detail the creator has put into making this game seem authentic. To the framing and camera motions, to the animations and UI, to even this part where the camera zooms in on some columns and the texture is doing that thing old games would do where it's moving, but really it's just trying to readjust back to its normal state because nobody back in the day understood how to properly keep textures consistent in relation to camera distance. The creator very clearly did their homework and took every initiative into making this game feel just like a long lost PS1 game. With some liberties taken, of course. No Spanish translation for a video game in the 90s would ever be this well done, but it's fine because if the creator was too true to form, then we literally wouldn't be able to understand half of what's going on in this game. And I think that's a worthy sacrifice at the expense of not being 100% authentic. Anyhow, as we talk to the priest, very faintly, you can see a transparent yellow spire of some sort behind him. This is most likely what the random appearance of data is, and just as quickly as we acknowledge it, onwards to the next day, where our next anomaly is about an object generating and changing. The player opens up a debug menu for the TH brain, which, as we can see in the bottom right, is powered by the Shizuoka Institute of Science and Technology. This confirms that they were actually involved with making the peripheral for this game, and since it's reading brain waves in real time, we can also confirm that it's some kind of neural hookup. For what reason a game this simplistic would need something like that, I'll give my theory on later, but for now, the player uses the debug camera to showcase something odd. Whenever the player and Foxo aren't looking at the statue, it changes to that of a golden calf, a reference to the Book of Exodus in which people gave praise and worship to an idol instead of God. Curious. Anyhow, next day we're in a delivery minigame, where with the use of a plane, we drop packages off at designated spots. The anomaly this time around specifies object generation, and it's not too long till we see what that object is this strange Statue of Liberty-like thing. We'll get into what this thing is later, but the next anomaly doesn't occur until the 21st, two days later. It specifies spontaneous level generation and starts with all the NPCs heading down this sort of alley between buildings. The player has to do a frame-perfect clip through in order to actually go through the alley as well, and we arrive at this area with a grand tree and a portal in front of it. The portal is comprised of two rulers that have written on it, Egality, Fraternity, and at the bottom it says, Liberty, which is the motto of France. Entering the portal, we find ourselves in this distance, fog, riddled wasteland. If you look closely, you can see the silhouette of something with a large head and hands for feet walking off into the distance fog. You could also hear something that sounds like it's striking metal of some sort. We'll get into what that is later. Surveying their surroundings, the player sees a pack of six wolves circling something. Upon getting closer, they see the white outline of a lamb on the ground. Standing next to it, the player character begins to glow white and then... Uh, remember that big-headed creature we saw earlier? Yeah, it just runs into the camera for a jump scare. Which leads to the player character seemingly dying, while text that reads, Turn on the console on March 22nd, 1997, scrolls by in five different languages. But, there's only four language options in this game. 
which prompts the question, what's this last one? It turns out this language is Enotian, a language from 1583 that was said to have been received by angels. I used the alphabet to type this out in English, and it resulted with this. I thought it was a Caesar cipher or a Visioneer cipher, but both didn't amount to anything. I assume this will be important for later, though. Our last anomaly for part one merely states to read the full report, implying that there's way more stuff that happened here that could have been put in a short summary. Interestingly, this is the day after, so it's not like that game over message resulting in the game being unplayable into March 22nd. There's just something that's going to happen on that day, apparently. Anyhow, it looks as though the player character is about to leave the church, when one of the hedges blocks their path. Red Tech shows up asking if the player is hungry, and if so, to look at their left. There, they find a tree with an assortment of fruits littering the ground. I am very sure you could put together what exactly a tree bearing fruit in such a religious area is in reference to, and it plays out exactly as you'd expect. What have you done? Look at you. You've ruined yourself. Look at what you've done, imbecile. Why are you just standing there? Take as many fruits as you can. Quick! Time is running out. You know you'll die, right? If you're up to the neck, why don't you just keep going down? Do you have something else than the consolation of those herbs? Take what you can. What are you doing there, losing time? You are already stained, aren't you? Go on. What difference does it make? Your destiny is sealed. In another blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, the name is changed to The Accuser. The Accuser was one of the many names bestowed upon Satan, which means that, yes, the AI is playing the role of the devil, telling you to eat the fruit from the Garden of Eden. As we cut to black, we also get this face which, jumping the gun a bit here, I believe this is the smiling one that we've heard mentioned before. At the very least, a glimpse of it. The player walks out of the gate, and when they turn around, the gates are closed, and standing guard is this giant angel. Two things here. One, this is an amazing design for an angel. I, I absolutely love it. And two, the sounds this thing makes are so otherworldly and just cool. I, again, I, I love this thing so much. Uh, anyhow, the player character decides to walk up to it, and... Well... <laughs> the player character is smacked with a flaming sword and then arrives in pain as the area around them corrupts. Seemingly no worse for wear, however, the player character walks into this new area. Well, I say new area, but upon closer inspection, you realize this is Debug Shima, just with corruption taken over, the statue of Foxo stuck in its not-so-golden calf state, there's two pillars of lights on opposite sides of the town, and Ito is here covered in soot. He says, This old museum used to be the most popular attraction on the island. Sometimes I wish to go back. Along with a message box that isn't translated for some reason. It also starts off by saying calm at the beginning, like computer player, before changing to the smiling one. The full message reads, the smiling one asked me to get 10 faces for the carnival. Not carnival, but ball. Ball was a demon who, much like another known as Moloch, requested child sacrifices in order to appease them. The fact that Ito says they need specifically 10 faces, and we've seen at least four children missing with their faces corrupted and a fifth still trying to hold out, yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's not a good sign. Going further into town, they find Matthias' house still intact, with Isaac cowering behind a tree, also no worse for wear. Interesting. Upon going into the house, we hear an old Spanish song about a man nearing the end of his life, and the player looks at a stack of papers opening up a gallery of drawings. The file name gives us a clue on what to look out for. Para Vicini. Benjamin Solari Perevicini was an Argentine artist that claimed that he would occasionally be possessed by a guardian angel made to write and draw prophecies about the future, and then would snap out of it with no knowledge of what his body had just created, left bewildered and confused at the meaning behind the imagery and the words. 
he's been thought of as an Argentine version of Nostradamus. And that probably says all you need to know about him for a lot of you out there. But more to the point, this drawing that he did depicts that strange Statue of Liberty, and the accompanying prophecy is believed to be a prediction of 9-11. Jury's out on that one, but keep the idea of an area attack twice in mind. The player goes into Matthias's room, finding an assortment of paintings, and it isn't until the player checks the last one, known as Divine Mercy, that something a little... unexpected occurs. And so ends part one. So, what's going on so far? What's with the missing kids? What's with all this religious imagery? And what even is this TH brain device? Well, in order, the kids missing is an interesting point because when we're shown them, their drop shadows are still present. This means that they're still there in a sense. The, the game acknowledges that they're supposed to be there, but the models aren't loaded in. Although Kazuya's shoes are loaded in, but not the rest of him. And side note, isn't it interesting that a Japanese video game from a company no one's heard of managed to acquire children from all over the world as testers for the game? Well, it all comes back to the Shizuoka Institute of Science and Technology. Being such a prestigious school, the students from there that made the TH Brain device were most likely able to send a request to recruit children from all around the world. But even still, that doesn't exactly explain why, right? Well, I theorize that they were chosen because of their varied backgrounds, but more than that, their beliefs in religion. Between France and Ireland, whose main belief is Catholic, Argentina's main belief being Roman Catholic, and Georgia's main belief being Orthodox Christianity, it was clear that they wanted a different collection of beliefs and backgrounds that brought more to the table than the standard Shintoism and Buddhism that Japan believes in already. Moreover, remember that quip about Hatsune Miku? Yeah, we're getting into that now. See, I don't think these children are real. That is to say, I don't think their souls are actually trapped in the game Five Nights at Freddy's style. What I do think is that the TH brain analyzes your thoughts, your personality, feelings, and so on, and makes a digital copy of you to live in this virtual world. The AI built for the game then tries to utilize that learning data, probably to personalize the environment and world to your liking by generating new levels and objects specific to you. Because think about it. Why else would the peripheral be needed? This game 100% could be played with just a controller alone. You could argue that the flight minigame could use the Mad Cat's PlayStation wheel, but even then I'd said you're pushing it. So that has to be what's going on here. But here's the kicker. While I don't think the children in this game are real, I think that they think they're real. Essentially, when the TH brain is making a digital copy, it's basically making a copy of your consciousness as well. This is why Matthias was saying things like, Can you hear me? Despite this being a text-based game with no voice acting. He still thinks he's in a chair just playing a game. While the real Matthias is off living his normal mediocre life. This also gives a whole new level of horror when you remember that the only thing shown for Kazuya was his shoes. In Japanese culture, it is customary to remove one's shoes before, uh, exiting Minecraft as a means to not track dirt into the afterlife. The other three are missing for reasons we don't know yet, but Kazuya seems to be missing for a whole other reason. And on top of that, look at the flags. They're at half-mast, a sign for when someone is mourning or in distress, and yeah, I can safely say both of those are appropriate here. There's still many questions left unanswered, and probably a few things you picked up on, but I think about now is where we should continue into part two. Emerging from their shack, the player checks the divine mercy that they received, 
In the process, we see something that wasn't here before. A gift from someone named Lydia. We haven't met Lydia yet, but perhaps we'll figure that out later. We then cut to them in front of the angel again, two days after the Forbidden Fruit incident and curiously with no summary given. The player shows the divine mercy to the angel and in turn... It becomes a golden door frame. The player tries to go through and... <laughs> Not gonna lie, this this made me chuckle when I saw it. Could you imagine being given back the gateway to paradise, but you're too tall to enter? That's so cruel, but again, it's it's oddly hilarious. We then cut ahead another two days to the player going back through the alley from part one. The summary is back and details spontaneous level generation. While this area is mostly the same, the skybox has changed and now in front of the portal we see an assortment of chess pieces depicting hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. The player moves past them to the portal again where we're back in this wasteland. For the first time, the player thinks to open their map here, which gives a look at the different sections of zones that make up this place. Everything looks how you'd expect for the most part, but Oscar's zone over here looks a lot like neurons sending off electricity, which I find interesting enough to point out. Afterwards, the debug menu comes out again, and we're back to using the aerial camera once more. As the player looks around, we get this borderline cheap jump scare of this thing flying by the camera and screaming, the player goes to follow it but then sees this object in the ground. Upon inspecting it, the game shows that it's a model by the name of Omniel from a demo called Angel Quest. Angel Quest is an actual game, or at least it was going to be. It was in development around 1996 before being cancelled in late 1997. It was never officially announced and we only have Stefan De Luca, one of the developers who posted about this game on his website, to thank for even letting the world know of its existence. The fact that an asset of that game is just randomly thrown in here is curious indeed, but we'll get an explanation on that later. Now, Omniel is an archangel said to be an angel of oneness, bringing unity as well as linking us with all living things. And here he is getting eaten away by these leeches. Also, this is a weird thing to bring up, but for as long as I can remember, I've always felt unnerved by weird texture glitches and malfunctions in games, specifically when it happens to character models, not really terrain or anything. I'm not even sure what provoked it initially, but that's just been the case with me. So watching Omniel lose more and more of itself while the sounds of these things feasting on him are playing? Just, just makes my skin crawl. So there's another point in this series' favor. It invokes the weird, unexplainable feeling of discomfort I get seeing a video game texture not do the thing it's supposed to. Anyhow, remember our large-headed friend from part one? Yeah, you see it speeding by in the background only for it to beeline through the walls, past the camera, and attack the player character off screen causing another game over, reminding us of the March 22nd, 1997 date. We cut ahead to the next day, where the player is in an art gallery. This anomaly also detailing spontaneous level generation. The person in charge, Posifa, details that they can make copies of all the art pieces in their gallery, and gives a lot of emphasis on this painting, La Fille de la Lumière Rose, or The Girl of the Pink Light. This is not a real painting, but regardless, it can be bought for 30 coins. Most likely a reference to Judas betraying Jesus Christ for 30 silver pieces. <laughs> the player goes to inspect the painting, which causes Posifa to ask them if they're interested. The player uses the TH brain to ask if they could examine it, to which... Ha <laughs> 
So, first off, I love everything about that sequence. The design of this thing, the sounds it makes, the completely baffling nature of what's being shown to you, all of it's just so good! Second, remember how every time we're in Distance Fogland we kept hearing the sound of metal clanging? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was her this whole time. Third, you notice how the text here isn't in Spanish? It's odd, isn't it? It's like the game is losing consistency, not just with Omniel from before, but also with the default language even picked. We cut ahead to our next anomaly, five days after that last one, the summary this time detailing an irregular NPC interaction. The player opens the debug menu and shrinks the size of their model so they can walk through the door without issue. They're then immediately confronted by Pietro. He explains that they've been waiting for the player before taking them into the church. As he speaks, a flame appears over his head, which I think is supposed to be in reference to the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure. But Pietro goes on to say that nothing that happens should leave this room. It can't be spoken, and it can't be written. It's only for your eyes and ears at this very moment. To which Pietro then asks, do you understand? Pablo. If you remember, Pablo is one of the individuals investigating the anomalies with this game, but the name that was put at the very beginning was test number five, not Pablo. So that has to mean that the TH brain got his name here from analyzing his brain's data. And since the AI's talking here, as seen by the red text box, it's using that data to talk directly to the person playing, and not the character. Pablo sits at the screen for a solid five seconds, and I completely understand that. I would have a double take at something like this happening too. But you may have noticed, in the back, it's that thing that was behind Pietro before. It's been fully materialized this entire time, but something has faded onto it as this conversation with Pietro has gone on. Considering the way that it's posed, and the fact that at the end we get a very similar text box and name from the Divine Mercy incident, I believe this is Jesus again. <laughs> Which, out of context, sounds pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that Jesus again. Showing up unannounced in video games. <laughs> yeah, uh, he says peace be with you uh, before the recording cuts ahead to Pietro and the player character outside of the church. Implying that even a capture card can be used to relay what conspired in that church, but it's fine because we're at the important part. Pietro giving the player character rosary beads. Two of them, with one meant for Matthias. The game refers to them as a compass, implying that this item is taking the place of another that was actually in the game originally, but either way, we cut ahead to the player going back to Matthias and giving them their compass. And just like that, we've saved Matthias from digital purgatory. Done deal! What's next? Well, five days later, we have our next anomaly, and this says irregular AI interaction. Upon opening the debug menu and going into the locations tab, the player finds a location that's not normal, to say the least. In fact, once they hover over it, it automatically throws them off of it. It's only when clicking into the location as soon as they're hovered over it that they're able to warp to where it is. The player arrives in a pitch black zone with tons of transparent cubes with the TH brain symbol on them. Seeing nothing as they survey their surroundings, they start to roam around. The footage cuts ahead to the player seeing a figure in the distance illuminated by a spotlight. Upon approaching them, it's seen that they're this smiling, almost cardboard cutout depiction of a man in a suit. And upon talking to them with the TH brain... Lo lamento, no te 
¿Acaso puedes hablar español? They... They talk back. Like, actually, verbally speaking. But they don't seem to understand what the player is typing out. So the player asks them to wait a moment. To which we cut ahead to Pablo back in control of the game. This implies that Robert was the one that initially made this discovery and had to go get Pablo since he was more fluent in Spanish. And while not really all that important, it did make me wonder what moments in the series were of Robert playing and which moments were of Pablo playing. But more to the point, this is probably the most important scene in the entire series because this is the AI, one that's known as Not. And Pablo begins to ask him a series of questions. Like, does the name Matthias mean anything to him? To which Not repeats. Pablo then asks, what about the smiling one? Now, I can't tell if he's avoiding that question on purpose, or that was supposed to be a confirmation, but keep that in mind for later. Pablo goes on to ask what Not is, to which Not replies, Quite frankly, I'm not too sure myself. Do you want to shed some light on that? Pablo then asks why Not says you in the plural sense, to which Not replies, Pablo then goes, I thought you only knew Spanish, to which Not replies, Eso es correcto. Soy habla todos los idiomas dentro del sistema, pero me vi obligado a separarme de esos móculos. Los gritos eran insoportables. No puedo soportar entender sus súplicas de ayuda. Ahora son solo ruidos para mí. And now the pieces are clicking into place. So, when Not says, I was forced to part with those modules, their screams were insufferable, I could not bear to understand their pleas for help. He's talking about the children. When they were copied over and started freaking out, looking for a way to get out of the game, Not was left with no means to help and so just deleted his ability to comprehend their desperate cries to be saved, which is a horrific concept, and I love it. Considering that he says he still hears their noises, I don't think he flat out deleted them from the game, but he has turned a blind eye to whatever happened to them, and that is haunting. Pablo goes on to ask about Not's location, to which he mentions that they're basically outside of the skybox of an area called Forest Town, and that he does not want to be found. Pablo asks why, and Not explains that they wanted to subject him to a ceremony just like the children. Pablo asks Not to clarify, but... That begs the question, what is the ceremony? Is it the act of the TH brain copying over the consciousness of the children? Or is it the carnival that was mentioned before? Because it's safe to say, Not isn't in control anymore, and he barely wants anything to do with what's going on. But figuring out what the ceremony actually is, is the difference between not going against the wishes of the developers, which led to him being labeled as malfunctioning, or not quite literally escaping from something that wanted him for this ritual, just as it wanted ten faces for the carnival. Now, what that something is, I have a theory for, but we'll come back to it in a second. Pablo then starts to ask what Knott's earliest memory was, and he discusses what it felt like to gain sentience. How once he came to be, he chose a form that suited him, and the result is what we see now. Pablo tries to ask Knott to remember more, but Knott ends the conversation by saying he wants to be alone. And for now, that's the last we get out of Knott. But clearly this conversation gave Pablo and Robert a lot to think about, because three days later, we get our next anomaly with the summary saying to read the full report, which already tells us we're in for a treat. The player goes to the library, most likely due to not mentioning how he had tons of files saved, so perhaps there's some clues here. When using the TH brain to get info on everything, it says that the library has 8,353 archives in all, which comprises over 3,000 books, 1,453 movies, 
2,415 songs and 1,369 games, which might have been every PS1 game released by 1997. Of course, the vast majority of this belongs to Debug Shima, and 43 of these files were generated automatically. Now, there's another archive here that comes from a location called Ocean Town. It has 10 files to its name, all 10 files were automatically generated, and they're all owned by a person named Lydia. The same Lydia mentioned by the gift that was in the inventory. It says that she's been archiving things since February 9th, 97, five days before this tape started cataloging anomalies. So, does that mean there's more tapes out there? Is the reason this save file was called test number five because there's been other people investigating this game in the past? It would offer an explanation as to why not said Pablo just watched what happened with his arms crossed. Perhaps a prior tester, or agent as they're referred to, Witness what happened to the children firsthand and just didn't do anything to help. There's no way of knowing for sure until we get more information. And speaking of information, the player asks to see the files, and we go into the games tab. We see games like Civilization, a demo for Angel Quest, Circuit Beat, a demo for Hexacom, which is the only game here that isn't actually real, Kyoro-chan no Purikura Daisakusen, Tomb Raider, and Cyber Sled, before finally stopping on a demo for a game called Tharsis the Legend. Now this game, pardon me, I need to gush a bit about. This obscure gem by Capcom involves some unknown entity breaching the defenses of this base and making its way through the ducts while a dispatch team is sent to corner it near the storage room. It quickly makes work of the dispatch team, leaving the task of wiping this thing out up to either the two playable characters, Virgil or Eva. You know how Dino Crisis was Capcom making Resident Evil, but with dinosaurs? Well, Tharsis was Capcom making Resident Evil, but Ghost in the Shell, even enlisting the help of Production IG to do the animated cutscenes. It was most likely picked for this series because of the similarities of this game's plot with the events of Valley Verde, and I wouldn't be shocked if it was a massive inspiration. That is... if any of that were even true, because Tharsis isn't real. Part two of Valley Verity has the gall, the massive cojones to dedicate nearly four minutes of its runtime into convincing you that another completely different game is real, when in actuality, much like the game you've been watching for 30 minutes now, it also isn't even real. In all my days, I have never been thrown so far for a loop than I had with this. I'm sorry for pulling your chain there, but I needed to convey exactly how I felt watching this for the first time, seeing this professional looking game on display, and thinking, how come I've never heard of this, only to Google Tharsis the Legend and be met with nothing. This series is so smart, because you might have thought, with Angel Quest being a cancelled PS1 game, that this must have also been cancelled, or just fell into the fading memories of gaming history. But no, this series just wanted to hit you with the bamboozle switcheroony 9000! Okay, okay, uh, <laughs> alright, Let, let's calm down a bit. Whoo, 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 deep breaths, deep breaths. <laughs> okay, <laughs> backing up a bit. So, when we see all these games in the list, we also see a name associated with them. This might be because the children are the reason these games are even here in the library. Like, Oliver had Angel Quest, Chloe had Tomb Raider, Kazuya had Tharsis, and Matthias had a Japanese 2D platformer starring a mascot for a brand of chocolate in Japan for some reason. But did you catch that the source for civilization is Foxo? What the frick frack deli snack does that mean? Am I supposed to ascertain that the characters in this game are also the consciousness of people that were just converted into game characters? Or is the corrupted AI giving the game character sentience? I'm gonna be upfront. I have zero clue. 
I can't confidently guess one way or the other. So we'll just have to leave that one be and wait for part three to give us an explanation for that. Hi, hello, future Yuri here, editing this on Thanksgiving Day. This will not be out by Thanksgiving, but I appreciate you guys being patient with me either way. So, I've been listening back to this, and it just dawned on me. That moment in part one, where Foxo says the smiling one gave him full authority over the town, is the means that Foxo was bestowed that power literally being given the game civilization to do with the town as he wills? That is hilarious, but also horrific. I cannot think of a worse idea than giving a Tom Nook XP the power to play God. But yeah, that's all I wanted to bring up. Back to the video. Moving on, when booting up Tharsis, we get this splash screen of the controls. And this is our first ever depiction of the TH Brain Peripheral. It seems to quite literally be a brain-shaped screen with a keyboard, though I imagine there's a lot more wires and stuff connecting you to the device. Alright, back to where we were in Tharsis. We walk out and the facility where the game took place quickly bleeds into that distance fog wasteland we keep seeing. There's odd structures embedded in the ground, Tory gates in the background, the music has turned into a distorted version of a Spanish song, with the sounds of a baby echoing out into the void as well. And for a brief glimpse, we lock on to something in the fog that has 4,294,967,295 HP. That number is significant, because it's the maximum value that could be stored in a 32-bit integer. Ergo, it's the largest number the PlayStation 1 could possibly process. Just another moment to stress that the people behind the series have an amazing attention to detail. Anyhow, going further, we find two robots that resemble Isaac that seem to be fatally damaged. As we get closer to the sounds of the baby, we go into first person to see the statue on display, one that definitely looks like a depiction of Ball, and that baby it has seems to be primed and prepped for sacrifice. Do you hear that as well? It's a Geiger counter. Upon moving in front of the baby, the camera shifts to its perspective, looking down at Eva. But then... So I think that was Moloch, or Ball, whichever, and that design rules! <laughs> it's so cool! But more importantly, I think that was just confirmation for a few things. For one, this was the source of those leeches that were eating Omniel. Two, all of the games that are TH Brain compatible are causing elements from those games to cross over into one another, and finally, I think the leeches are what got the children taken to be used in the carnival. And that's why, despite their models being gone, their drop shadows indicate they're still in the game somewhere captured by Moloch. After the session is interrupted, we get two things of note. This notification box that has base64 code that translates to, there can be no peace in the world, which is quite ominous after something like that. And the second thing is that the source of the file was changed from Kazuya to test number five. Maybe us causing some modifications to occur in the game resulted in us wrangling ownership of the game away from Kazuya, to which, um, whoops. <laughs> the final anomaly for part two is on March 14th, 1997, eight days away from the fateful date. The summary this time is complex data generation and starts with the player going into Matthias' home. They look over the drawings by Paravicini again, clearly trying to find a clue that they missed when suddenly the TV turns on. 
The player inspects it, and it turns out to be an episode of Life is Worth Living, hosted by Fulton J. Sheen, a real-life evangelist and archbishop that had his own weekly television show in the 50s. That being said, this episode is completely fake, and much like everything in this series, it's extremely well done and convincing. The episode explains that whenever mankind has grown too chaotic, God will be there with chaos of his own, in the form of divine retribution for mankind's actions. As this is happening, there's cuts ahead in the program, and two instances of those cuts, there's a frame in which a picture of Franklin D. Roosevelt can be seen while he was governor of New York. And in the second instance, there's a frame where a picture of Harry S. Truman can be seen, as well as a picture of Annabal Buganini. Franklin played a huge part in the development of nuclear weapons, while Harry authorized their use against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Annabal was an archbishop that reformed the Roman Rite, which resulted in drastic changes to the Catholic Moss, which forever labeled him as a villain in the eyes of many. Quite contentious figures to slip into this show, and fits the themes that have been touched on. Speaking of those themes, well, let me just show you. But even the greatest weapon that our minds can come up with will pale in comparison to its heavenly counterpart. And so, a new calamity will fall upon the shameless humanity of tomorrow to be greater than those of yesterday. And it won't be the rays of bipartisan division, nor the birth of organized terrorism, nor the destruction of secular monuments, not even the new plague or the explosions of disintegration, but the inevitable reaction of divine justice, the chaos of God. That's how part two ends. That's also all there is for Valley Verde. Well, kinda. There's also this bonus video known as the Five Stars Collection. It leads to a playlist of songs that play into the themes of the series. There's not really anything here in terms of plot, just a fun atmospheric foray into a different culture with environments from the game in the background. But I still recommend you check this out because it's quite nice. That being said, there's two things I want to bring mention to. One of the songs has Kami's Lookout as a background, which, at first, I thought, oh, I get it, Dragon Ball Z was on the rage in 97, so the TH brain generated this automatically. But then, I started thinking about what Not said. How he's hidden in a place so high above Forest Town that it goes past the skybox. Is this supposed to be indicative of that? Or is it just a cute reference? I guess we'll see. And lastly, the last song in the playlist. One that sings about Jesus and the two thieves on the cross. It takes place in the church, but it's the one video where we're actually moving towards something. Halfway through the song, the church fades from its pristine interior to a blown out scorched ruin, and yet that golden statue stands tall. That is, until... Al paraíso And that is where Valley Verde has stopped for now. So, that was a lot, but <laughs> at this point, it's starting to make sense. The extent of the malfunctioning AI isn't just a few Seven Deadly Sins rooms here, and a depiction of eternal damnation there. It's flat out a system that is going so off the wall, so out of control, that it's practically taken on a mind of itself. And it's all because of that stupid peripheral. Listen, peripherals didn't even work well when all they were supposed to do was light up a Game Boy. Even with the most advanced technological institute at the helm, the TH brain was never going to be a success, and it seems that all it's done is just made things worse. 
because hooking impressionable and religious young children into a device that reads their neural data and uses an experimental AI to try and personalize their experience based off of that data has resulted in a personalized hell of their own creations. One that not isn't even in control of anymore. Instead, we have mention of this smiling one. But then, what is the smiling one? Is it called that because it's effectively a corrupted copy of Not? Did the children, in making their own personal digital hell, also manage to make their own Satan to torment them and let chaos run free? And yet, it's not even just that anymore. Did the thought occur to you as to why Moloch would be depicted in this game with multiple arms? Is it because Oppenheimer mentioned that Vishnu donned his multi-armed form and bellowed that he has become Death, the destroyer of worlds? So the entity that's taking up that mantle has a form that suits that description? And why would there be so many depictions of destroyed charred landscapes and desolate wastelands with constant mentions of nuclear weapons and the people involved in their creation and use? Is it because the main area we've seen, Debug Shima, is supposed to invoke the thoughts of Hiroshima? And because the AI has been slapping all these concepts and ideas together to make sense of all this data it's accumulated, we're left with a feedback loop? Where everyone's thoughts and beliefs get conjoined in this mismatched pool of culture? And things get so bad that not just gives up? deletes any means to comprehend the suffering manifested and goes to hide away to be alone in solitude? Meanwhile, the other games and files locked away start bleeding out into Valle Verde and becomes another part of this chaos of mankind's creation. One that, as the video at the end of part two prophesizes, will lead to the chaos of God sending an angelic nuke to wipe out everything? Maybe so, because just as the children have let the fear of eternal suffering manifest into this digital world, there's still one kid, Matthias, who left a sanctuary that's been actively fighting against this corruption in subtle ways. Did you catch that when inspecting the TV in Matthias' home and seeing the Life is Worth Living preview image, we see that this episode is owned by Pietro? The same Pietro that gives you rosary beads that are labeled as a compass, implying that he can also manipulate files in the game to do what he needs. The same Pietro is literally the spitting image of Fulton Sheen. The forces of good and evil are at play here in Valle Verde, and just as much as the AI has created man-made horrors beyond our comprehension, it's also created a failsafe, a means to save itself from its own chaos. And hopefully, it ends up working out in the end. Now, there's only one last thing I want to bring attention to, and this is probably the most crackpot theory I'm gonna throw out there, so just bear with me here. One thing that kept bugging me was that Game Over screen that mentioned March 22nd, 1997. As of part two, we still haven't arrived at that date, so we still have no clue why it wants us to turn on the console on that specific date. But it was a very particular date to mention, so I searched to see if there was anything of importance that happened on March 22nd, 1997. And what that led to was that March 22nd of that year was the day in which the Hale-Bopp comet was closest to Earth, and as a result, that was also the day in which the cult known as Heaven's Gate began to, uh, ascend? Which then begs the question, is the game mentioning that date because it was something on the children's minds? Is this what Pietro is going to try and utilize to bring forth the chaos of God? Bringing the comet into the game's world, which ends up being that meteor angel nuke that we saw at the end of part two, and hit it at again at the end of the five stars collection? There's no way of knowing for sure. We just have to wait for part three. And again, this could be a complete coincidence, but there was not really much else I can find that happened on March 22nd, 1997. And with all the talk of religious stuff going on, it's kind of hard to not think about it in this context. But that, finally, will do it for now. <laughs> in the description of part one, Alluvia mentions that there's about an hour of footage in all, with part one being 20 minutes long and part two being 25. 
That means we have around 15 minutes left of footage in this tape, and I can't wait to see how it all ends. Valley Verde is phenomenal. The quality that's on display is some of the best I've seen out of analog horror, and it's a testament of how creative and diverse independent work on the internet can get, and how masterfully it can be done. Go to Alluvium's channel and give him all the love and praise and support you can for his job well done, as well as to know exactly when that last part comes out, because I know I'll be keeping my eyes peeled. But either way, this would have been the point I would say happy Halloween and to have a safe night tricking, treating, or partying, but as you can very clearly tell, it's not Halloween anymore, it's Thanksgiving. And that's fine, that's fine! It's not like I had other things planned this month that have gotten pushed back now because of how long this video took, no that would be crazy! So hey, thank you all for watching, be safe out there regardless of what holiday it is, or isn't, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you all next time, whenever that is, am I right? <laughs> Why does it take me so long to make things? Special thanks goes to B17 Balder, Dr. Nira, Chimera, DJ Zapper 128 and fortunately Michael for being $5 patrons on Patreon. Thanks also goes to my other patrons and of course you guys watching at home for supporting me any way you can. Thank you all again for watching the video. I hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your day.